Hello, anybody there? It's Sam Silva. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? So wonderful. Great to meet you. Yeah, it's nice to meet you too. I appreciate you doing this. How long have you been doing the podcast? So the podcast started in 2021. Uh, oh. I, I think it was about yeah May or April of 21. And this has just been a remarkable experience. Initially, I just started interviewing my friends. Uh, you know, the theater people, you know, and, and actors and, and, you know, people that I love so much. And then suddenly things started opening up. And now I'm talking to poets and, and directors, filmmakers, you know, a lot of independent folks. So yeah. I'm really excited to get to talk to you today because y there's just so much to talk about. <laughs> there uh, is. There so is. do you mind if we start at the beginning since we're rocking and rolling? Yeah, let's go. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> so. You are a screenwriter and more recently a novelist. Uh, you're still doing a lot of dramatic writing, it seems like. But before we get to the novels that, that just sound remarkable, can we talk about the beginning and why Idaho? Where does Idaho come into the picture? Because you're my neighbor as well. Uh, I'm saying hi from Wyoming. Oh, and <laughs> okay. All right. And I'm interested in how you find your way into the creative life, into that of a storyteller and, and writer. Yeah, it's such a it's such a great question. Um so I've been living I I lived in Idaho. I went to high school here and did my undergrad here in part. Mm -hmm. And then when I left to go, you know, do grad school, I actually have a master's in international affairs, mm -hmm. weirdly. Um, but I, but, you know, lived in Italy and Washington, D.C. and then worked in San Francisco. And I just thought, oh, I'll never go back to Idaho ever. <laughs> I'm just young Idaho. You know, so many young people do. And then um, the company that I, the consulting company, small that I worked for in, in San Francisco folded. And so, you know, I had, I had like $5,000 in the bank. And I thought that seemed like so much money <laughs> at 30 years old. Yeah. So, that um that I would go back to Italy and just live in Italy until the money ran out and mm. then I'd that was but but on the way to Italy I literally stopped in Idaho to see my family for Christmas and there happened to be another Idaho in there who was back who'd been living in London for ten years he was a a, a Rhodes scholar and you know ended up ended up at at um at oxford and then lived in london was a theater director and then a filmmaker and so you know he was also in boise visiting his family and we sort of met and fell in love and um and you know at that at that point he was having a big a, a big enough career that he could live anywhere he wanted to and so very quickly you know we kind of decided well you know let's stay in idaho and see what happens for a while because you can be anywhere um, I don't know what I'm doing. And, you know, very, very quickly, I became an informal script reader for him. So, you know, screenplays would arrive, you know, by the dozens every every month, and he couldn't get through them. And he trusted my, we, you know, we shared an aesthetic. He trusted my, my, um, my criticism. And so, you know, as would anyone, after you've read four or five terrible screenplays, <laughs> you think, oh, I can do this. This doesn't look mm. that hard. So I can do better. And so here we were in Idaho and I was very much, you know, between things. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd written as a kid and my, my dad was a journalist when I was growing up. He worked for Life magazine mm -hmm. in the heyday. And so, you know, the world was always full of writers for me. And I, and I understood that that was a possibility. I just, I'm not trying to figure out how to make a living at it, yeah. you know, but here, but here I was um, actually, you know, starting to have children, starting to write, starting to learn how to write. And my then husband um, was was a you know a great storyteller himself, and I you know I learned a lot from him. And um, you write you know you write four or five bad screenplays yourself before you it finally kicks in and you begin to understand the discipline, mm -hmm. and the requirements of the form. And so you know eventually, I wrote this script now called Mr. Dickens and His Carol, and that's the script that got me an agent, really an entree into Hollywood. Um, you know, we spent over the next 15 years while I was raising kids in Idaho. <laughs> so over the next 15 years, we optioned the screenplay four different times, four different companies in the U.S., U.K., and Europe, including New Line Cinema. And each time, which is so common, you know, in the business, 
it would get re- it would get close and then it would fall apart for some mm. reason or an executive would leave who was the champion you, you know financing would fall apart so i had every possible heartbreak on offer in hollywood really and um and at the point personally when when my marriage fell apart um, 12 years ago i really thought i need to reinvent my writing life you know i don't want to became clear that if i really wanted to continue in the business i would need to move to la and i didn't want to do that i still had you know kids in school and and you know my life was here and so i thought well <laughs> you know i know the story works because i've sold it four times yeah so i guess i find my hand at writing a novel i I'd, I'd, I'd written short fiction at that point and um thought it would be again like screenwriting i thought it would be easier than it was huh. because you know as i as i think about it and stop me if i'm no please know, this is wonderful I, yeah so um you know i realized at some point that as a screenwriter what you're doing is creating an efficient blueprint for the film that you want to get made. And if you, mm-hmm. you know, if you do hit the lottery and, you know, and get your film made, there are people who arrive on set. I saw this over and over with my filmmaker husband, you know, who are working at the top of their game and they are, you know, production designers and, and set dressers and customers, and, you know, props people. I mean, all, you know, all the stuff that, um, that make the blueprint come to life as a film. But as a novelist, you have to take on all those jobs, you know, including cinematographer, including actor. I mean, you're creating, you know, the interior life of the character, which you can't do in a screenplay, which comes really in performance. That's interesting. And- oh, sorry to interject, but it seems like there is extreme ownership of of the story, whereas I think a lot of us people in playwriting, dramatic writing of any kind, we rely on the completion, the handing off. And there is a, a like a certain pleasure in that, that we don't get to have in a novel. But I think that's the terrifying part, too. You start on on the work. Can you describe what that transition is like to to realize the story from this shell of dramatic writing, this this blueprint to fill the holes that are that are there as you're transitioning it into into a novel. But I think because I cut my teeth as a screenwriter, I'm very structure oriented and very plot oriented. And, you know, because again, the story worked, I knew the plot worked. That wasn't where the challenge was. And it took me three complete drafts and each draft took me a full year. And, it, you know, each time it was about going deeper and richer and more layering and more texturing and, um, you know, again, taking on those jobs that you don't have as a playwright and you don't have as a, as a, as a screenwriter. And, you know, along the way, I would send the draft, you know, whenever you finish a draft as a writer, you think, well, it's perfect. You know, I can't do any better. <laughs> and that's when you make the mistake of sending it out to, you know, your first group of agents. Mm. And I, you know, I had, I had some n- nice and kind responses, but um, in the best one after the first draft was um, a bit, you know, a big agent. She said, I really wanted to love this, but it felt like notes on a novel. Oh, wow. Which is, which was useful because, huh. because I understood at that point, yes, I'm still writing really in screenplay form. And, and, you know, trying to add, you know, detail and it's not enough. And then the, the, the second draft, I actually hired an editor, a developmental editor who, who, you know, would help me sort out. And he said, you know, again, the story really works like gangbusters, but, um, but you, you've got this sort of omniscient, very Victorian, very 19th century point of view. He said it's incredibly old fashioned. No one does it anymore, <laughs> you know, except, <laughs> except the masters. Really, you know, you need to go through the whole novel and rewrite it through cl- close third point of view, which me- you know, I mean, filtering everything through through Dickens' experience, and that took me another year. Oh my goodness! But, but it was a great note. It was a great note, and, and so you know, again, a, a lot of it was. I mean, just being able to sort of shift and start over from page one and say, okay, this time it'll be different. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do it better and I'll find the places 
to be to elaborate and and to be detailed and you know and to, and try to find the balance of the right amount of detail and leaving enough to the imagination of the reader and you know so finally you know after 3 years on the third draft i sent it out to pretty pretty well researched agents who i thought might have a taste for it and you know within within a month i had a, you know an agent in new york and within another month a two book deal oh goodness so yeah. you no know, so that's yeah. the only way you know it's working is to get make sure that you get that feedback loop coming coming in and uh yes and if it's not if agents are aren't interested in you know seeing the full manuscript or um or making Mm -hmm. you offers then you need to go back to the drawing board the problem isn't them the problem is the piece Mm -hmm. and i am i was going to say i imagine that you felt pretty comfortable with that process given your your time in screenwriting where you were just up against the wall trying just constantly getting those notes and and bouncing back and forth. Is that something that you brought with you that you just felt like it wasn't affecting you? Or was there like an emotional part of it where you you had to overcome feeling defeated at any point during during this process? I, I, as you say, I think I developed a very thick skin over a long time trying to living as a screenwriter. It's brutal, and 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 my you know my my then husband was was also um, you know really gifted as a storyteller, but really brutal as a critic, and uh, he never soft peddled anything, and he I mean he you know he supported my work and 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 loved my work, in in many ways. But he said to me once, he said you I think you have an infantile relationship with your writing. Oh, I was going to ask you about this because I was listening to this podcast that you did. Uh, it was the um inside the writer's uh, studio, I believe. And it was just this, I highly recommend people check out that conversation. It was really informative, but I, I'm curious what, how you reconcile that. And I totally cut you off, but I just wanted to share what a moment that was. I actually wrote it in my quote book because I was like, this is, this is something that I re- that really resonated with me. And I wanted to know how that journey from overcoming that uh, turned out for you, but I'll, I'll let you go on that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was, a, it was an important moment for me because at first you, f- you feel hurt. And, and the full, the full thing that he said to me was, I think you have an infantile relationship with your writing because you go off into your room all by yourself and you come out months later and say, look at this thing I made. Do you love me? And, and, you know, my, you know, after sort of having my feelings hurt by it, I then immediately thought, you're exactly like that too. <laughs> you know, with the stuff you write, and the films you make, every artist I know is like that. As, you know, every, certainly every solitary artist is, is, is like that because we do live a solitary life. We do live in our heads. And, and the thing we work on, we want to be loved for because we're pouring our hearts out on the page and we're you know giving of ourselves and the more vulnerable you are on the page and um the more giving and generous you are of yourself uh, you know on the page the the more you want people to love it at the end (laughs) and i think you know when artists want people to love their work they want people to love them and that's how that's also sort of just you know a basic human desire to be loved for the things we create and i just think artists feel it more profoundly because because it's not filtered through anything else through an organization or any other kind of experience um or bureaucracy it's we have such a direct relationship between you know thumbs up thumbs down and ourselves especially right now yeah it's it's one of those yes or no it's a very binary Yes, we like you. No, get out of here. <laughs> We're yeah. not interested today. Exactly. But- exactly. And so I did I did develop a, a thick skin because of that, but also the realization that all artists are like that. And and I think I think it's something that um that bonds us and unifies us. And I found, I mean, t- you know, to be really honest, that um there's certainly a movement in, you know, in writing groups and writing workshops to be much kinder and gentler with each other and not be so competitive and hypercritical, which I support and I, you know, and I, and I love, but I think sometimes it, it, you know, errs on the side of not getting, you know, not sort of getting, you know, doing the close work 
and close questioning of work that needs to be done. And that I'm, I'm just not afraid of it because I had to go through it so often, you know, and have the self-doubt and self-questioning and then go back to the work and then find, you know, be depressed for a few days and then go back to the work and start again and say, okay, well, that's the note I've been given. So mm -hmm. I can fight all I want, or I can try to try to incorporate the note. And I also think, you know, so often when someone gives you criticism that doesn't sit right with you, there's a germ in it that is right, mm -hmm. even if the specific criticism is wrong. And so I think, I think, you know, you have to sit with it and try to explore by yourself what in that is true for me. What it, you know, what does it point to? Because what it means is something's not working on the page. Yeah, because it, it does seem like uh, as a default, a lot of us have that have that barrier. But then we have to find a way to translate the content of that feedback in order for it to make sense to us. Because yes. at least for me, that's something that took a very long time. But college was amazing for that because I was just like getting that left and right. But you have to figure out that language for it to really just pour through that wall and and really make its way into something that made sense for you. Um, but I'm curious not to digress or or go back to what we were talking about here with the novel, the first one. I love the um this idea that you started talking about in the other podcast about the sort of getting the the vernacular of the time or what that voice was like. How how do you go about finding the the balance of that, you know, and, and really staying true to your voice rather than than approximate Dickens or approximate the language of the time? Because there's a lot of information. I mean, the the amount of research that was done for this is pretty remarkable. And you had time to sit with it. How much of like when did you figure out what was you and what was the research talking? Um, because I think that's a really interesting thing to balance. Yes, it's a tricky thing to balance. And I, I, I was a history major, and so I love, I love, I love research. I love yeah. rabbit holes, you know. And I'll be—I'm known to spend an entire afternoon looking at where lace comes from, <laughs> and you know, what would be, what lace would be on the inside of a woman's sleeve, and you know, the intricacies of that. So um, I have to be careful. I have to sort of stop myself. Um, so I've written two historical fiction novels. All of my short stories are contemporary in my contemporary voice, which I find a respite from the historical fiction, which you know does require so much research and really trying to inhabit another time um, another mind, another, um, you know, way, way of being. And, um, it, you know, if I may talk about, compare the two experiences of with, um, with Mr. Dickens, it was much, I was, you know, I was dealing with a six week period in his life during which he wrote Christmas Carol. And so I, when the, you know, when the idea, when the, when the story came to me, really came to me as a bolt from the blue. Like someone had, you know, a friend had suggested, oh, Dickens writing the Carol and ghost stories. And it had never, you know, never landed with me. But two years later, I sort of sat up in bed and knew exactly what the story was. And it, and I never veered from it. So that, you know, that, that in some ways, you know, did feel like a gift somewhere from, you know, the muses or you know, the gods or whatever it was. And there, and there were moments, I mean, because, it was so clear to me, you know, when I started to like after, you, you know, all the reading, all the biographies and more and more Dickens and, you, you, you know, I started to have his voice in my head mm. all the time. And so I would get up, my kids were really little and I would get up at 530 in the morning when the house was dark and I could hear <laughs> the back and, you know, and I, and I really was that feeling of just, I'm going to sit here and take dictation and you tell me what to say you know, that I was in some way his muse and, you know, channeling, channeling his voice. And, I, you know, I have not had that experience since. I, really, I think I thought everything would be like that, you know, as a, as, as a novelist, but it, but oh. it was, but it was, you know, glorious experience. And it wasn't, it wasn't always, it, it wasn't, and that's the writing of the screenplay. And, um, but, you know, it was similar in the novel. It was like, oh, you, it's you, old friend. Dickens, we're back. We're doing this thing mm -hmm. again. And, you know, I always had the feeling of him looking over my shoulder. <laughs> so, um, 
and and urging me on. And in fact, I, I wrote a I wrote a piece for that was on Lit Hub called Temptations of the Muse, which was about really my long love affair with Charles Dickens. And so, you know, in the in the beginning, he's I think I'm his muse, and by the end, I realize that he's my muse. And so it was a really great experience. But in writing about Mary Wollstonecraft, you know, the mother of feminism, um, mother of Mary Shelley, I was I had sort of you know agreed to write a novel about her <laughs> to fulfill my you know my two book deal, and I knew almost yeah. nothing about her, and mm -hmm. I was trying to encompass an entire life as opposed to the six week period. I mean, when you have, you know, the constraints, you can play, you can really play. But when you're trying to un encompass an entire life, it's much more, it's much more daunting and difficult. And because I never felt like I, you know, in the beginning, I knew who she was, I had her voice in my head, I didn't have that. And so, um, you know, once again, go, I went back to the biographies, the collected letters, her own writing, and you and you wait and you wait for the voice to start just living in your head yeah. and you know and what is that and how do your how do your thoughts form how are your sentences formed um what you know what animates you what emotions animate you what you know what right. injustice animates you what experiences animate you and um you know and eventually you start you start writing just and it's not always at the beginning you know again i said i'm a structuralist and sort of devoted to plot as a driver you know but sometimes i'll start wherever the scene is in my head where i hear her voice most strongly it seems like because of your your ability to handle research and to be comfortable with with looking at historical context and and trying to build that part of the um the story for yourself it's almost like so much has to be experienced through this research that you have to sit with it to humanize it again. Is that some, something like a fair assessment of it? Because, you know, and just for context here for the folks who are listening, the novel is Love and Fury, a novel of Mary Wollstonecraft, set in 1797. And you mentioned something about, in, in another podcast, of about Mary being arguably the world's first feminist. And I, that conversation was so engaging. And I'll put it in the episode description. But for somebody who had a very, I mean, in that time period, it's, it's such a difficult time to be a woman, especially one as vocal and as um, committed to the cause as Mary was. What were the ways that allowed you to go in to, as you were saying, to, to find your way into this human being? Right. Um, I, think, I think three things. The the first is when you're reading about her real life, by you know scholars and amazing biographers, and you're looking for as a novelist the cracks in the story and the crumbs that the biographers leave you, because there are things that they can't confirm that you know they want to, you know they 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 you know intimate mate they suggest they. And where those places are, you start to think, oh, that's where I can play. That's where I can start to create my own, you know, idea about Mary's life. For instance, um, you know, she had this incredible, I think the love of her life was this um, woman, Fanny Blood, she met when she was 17 or 18. And um, Fanny died of after childbirth, she was tubercular mm -hmm. in, in Portugal where, and Mary was with her, but it was the great love of her life. And mm -hmm. almost all the biographers really circle around this question of, were they actually lovers? Mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no hard evidence and it's not in their letters, of course, as it wouldn't be, but it was a place that I got to play and I got to, you know, it's, explore that and explore that relationship and in some ways as a novelist it was a gift i could give her yeah and a gift i could give them here i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna make up this story about your relationship that that, mm -hmm. that no one else can confirm um so 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 some of it is about you know following the cracks and the crumbs that the biographers leave you the mm -hmm. second thing is finding a frame because you can never you can't start you know, unless you're David Copperfield, you know, on the day you're born, <laughs> you know, go all the way to death. I mean, I think it's, it's important to find a frame that helps you 
you know, structure the novel and make hard choices about what matters. And so mm -hmm. the frame for me, I, I had um, right behind me, I set up a butcher paper for months with multicolored <laughs> post-it notes. You know, and I would just write things like, this seems important, this seems important, and I'd move them around and, you know, trying to find sort of the narrative arc and the, and the shape. But it wasn't until I really came to, I want to tell this in 11 stories and Mary's life. And each, each of those is one day, one of the days between when she gave birth to Mary Shelley, who was expected to die. And then 10 days later, Mary Wollstonecraft is the one who dies of puerperal fever. And, and so I, and so I wanted, uh, you know, for, for each day to be a chapter, each of those days and to think about what, you know, 10 or 11 stories would Mary Wollstonecraft want Mary Shelley to know? And so then you really have to choose, you know, as, as you could do or I could do, what are the 10 most significant plot points in your own life? The stories where you're put under pressure as a character have to make a choice, and that choice alters the trajectory of your life or who you are as a human being. And so, you know, so, so that was the other thing was finding the frame for the novel that allowed me or that forced me to make hard choices. And then the third thing is, is really what you're referring to, which is finding your voice in their voice and their voice in your voice. And I think, you know, it was intimidating to approach such an icon of feminism. And um, I, you know, I, I just, she's a towering figure to me as Charles Dickens. Yeah. But she was also a human being and a woman and lived as a woman in a difficult time. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, I had to sort of think, well, were the, the time was different, but were the feelings different? You're still a woman. You're still a woman mm -hmm. swimming in the patriarchy and feeling the injustice of being a woman, feeling mm -hmm. all the injustices and the way that the patriarchy is trying to control you and your choices and your education and your body and what you wear. And, you know, all those things are still happening to us. And so, so that was a way to connect with her just as a woman. And, and, and mm -hmm. her voices began, I think, to mingle at that point. Yeah. It's wonderful that you mentioned this because my next question was going to be in regards to the timeliness of her story as a reminder of some of the things that we're still arguing about, which is very unnecessary that women still have to have these kinds of fights about what is their autonomy, right? You know, and, and should they have that autonomy at all? That it doesn't make any sense. But is there a kind of legacy that you're touching on in terms of what Mary passed on to the other Mary and how that might help us? kind of work our way in this world. You've, you've talked a little bit about it, but I'm curious if in the book um, there is that sense of legacy of passing on those lessons and um, how can we apply those lessons? And, you know, obviously I'm speaking out of turn in some ways because I'm just a man, but <laughs> you know, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that in terms of lessons of strength during difficult times yeah. for women. And, and let me start by saying men can be allies and fight against the patriarchy <laughs> because in some ways you're victims of it too. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're in it, we're in it together. And mm -hmm. um, I do, it was, it was a strange experience as I was writing the novel. It took me about two years mm -hmm. and, you know, to see these issues coming even more to the fore, like, Oh my God, now we're going to revisit, you know, we're going to revisit the 1960s. We're going to revisit Roe. We're going to revisit birth control. We're going to revisit, you know, and with the pandemic, of course, you know, women bore the brunt of it. Women with children, brunt of it. And it will take, it will take, you know, maybe decades for them to get back into, you know, the workforce in, you know, in a way. And that is by design. That is, you know, that is the power structure, um, you know, confirming its own itself and its own bias and, and women as, you know, readily made victims of it. I mean, I, you know, I do think 
it was also, you know, sort of during the rise of Me Too that I'm writing and the, you know, the power of Me Too movement. And so in some ways I felt like, you know, Mary was also Me Too. Like, yes, I've, you know, I've been hurt by men and I've been hurt by the patriarchy. It hurts me all the time. But, um, but the power of her sense of injustice, which really originates in her family of origin, really dysfunctional family with an abusive father, you know, a brother who was not brighter than she was, but afforded all the opportunities and all the, all the, you know, the, the, the wealth, any, any, you know, residual wealth that was passed on. And the girls had nothing, nothing. And, you know, except to maybe be governesses. And so to see her, you know, develop this, this, you know, core sense of injustice and that she would have to she would fight it every day of her life, and then she would live her own life as an example of that mm-hmm. fight. So, um, you know, I always say, yes, I, you know, she's a mother of feminism in many ways, but there was, feminism wasn't a word then. She invents the life. And, you know, as, as, as feminism has gone through, you know, waves and history, and, you know, we're still inventing the life. And, you know, and women get to do that. We get to say what it feels like to be us, you know, what our bodies mean to us, what our choices mean to us. And so I, I think the power of Mary's story is, is still resonates. And I feel like every, you know, hundred years since she's died, she has, you know, she has sort of another moment um, in, in the light. And the most gratifying for, thing for me as an author is when young women, a new generation of women, discover Mary mm. left. Yeah. And, you know, someone will say, oh, I read this book and I saw my own story. Like women of a certain age, you know, who grew up in the 60s, they say, oh, God, this was my story. I really felt close to her. And I'm buying this for my, you know, for my daughter, for all my daughters, for my, you know, and sort of one generation passing the book on to the next generation is very important to me. Because I think it is time for Wollstonecraft once again, you know, to rise from the dead and say, I'm still here and I'm still with you. And we are all Wollstonecraft. We are all. Still a beacon. Yes, yes. In fact, I think, you know, I love her name so much, Wollstonecraft, because I think it's like a superhero. (laughs) It's like a superhero name. Very much so, yeah. (laughs) She's very alive to me. She's very alive. To touch on this a little bit more, I'm curious as being being somebody from this region wyoming and idaho are siblings in in many ways politically culturally there's a lot of overlap and given the topic the themes in this work how does you living in idaho impact the way that you're writing this there there is absolutely i count i count idaho among the, among the states that are that are um taking really you know terrible right wing turn alt right wing not even you know it's been conservative for since for years and you know we're also the state that once you know produced frank church and some really you know cecil andrus some really incredible um incredible moderate liberals um but and I th- and I think about this as a writer too because I really admire the people in these red states who don't give up, who are still fighting the fight, you know, and and fighting against the tide. And um, it's a it's really tough. And and the victories are few and far between, but there are victories. And I admire the activism is takes it's very labor intensive. It takes an extraordinary commitment, and. Again, because I'm solitary as a writer, sometimes I feel like, well, what I have are these words. What I have is what what I, you know, what I can put on the page and to make my argument and then put it out in the world and and you know, it's my world and and hope that it's well received. And so it does connect you to people, you know, to, to the people who who see the world in that way, um, as an expansive, open-hearted, tolerant, just possible place. And um, so, I, so I think that it's, it's gratifying. Again, you know, really difficult to be by yourself in the room for two or three years, coming out, you know, to I, in Idaho and saying, here's what I made, do you love me? <laughs> 
but uh. but you do you know you do find your people i mean i just um read demon copperhead by barbara king solver you know mm -hmm. she's from kentucky and it's you know retelling of david copperfield um but but sort of based in 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 the you know conservative south and um it's it's just so glorious and mm. i think will touch because it's so much you know set in poverty and the op opioid epidemic uh, epidemic that i think will really touch a lot of people even conservative mm. people um who who have been touched in the same way we all have by you know the epidemics of poverty and uh, op opioid addiction so you know it's a reminder how powerful david copperfield was and demon mm. copperhead is and can be and that's what i have that's you know i have my words that's how i that's what i make things out of <laughs> that's so incredible um i'm i'm probably digressing a bit on this but maybe bringing it back full circle i wanted to ask you why dickens we're mentioning these ideas of of class and poverty and all of the the big ideas that dickens tried to grapple with as you know in, in his time what drew you to him initially that made him sort of a north star for a lot of the work that you that you've done was it the themes was it the life story mm. well again i when when i started the project strangely i wasn't a you know dickensophile i hadn't i'd sort of um, the requisite dickens and you know in high in high school and then was like oh thank god i'm done with dickens you know i've checked those boxes <laughs> off and so i really only began to read about him and and more of his work as i was working on the the screenplay initially the story developing the story and my god it was such an awakening um, because because he is i mean in addition i think to just being you know one of the greatest writers in the english language ever on you know inarguably um he is so like Wollstonecraft, so moved, so, you know, empowered by, you know, what he sees, the injustices, the poverty. And, you know, and in some ways, um, it's driven by his own experience because, you know, when he was 11 years old, his father went to Dedra's prison and took his entire family, except for Dickens, who was, had to stay and work in, in Warren's blacking warehouse, you know, putting labels mm -hmm. on, on uh, boot polish bottles for a year trying to save enough money you know eat one stale pastry a day and save enough money to spring his father yeah. from debtor's prison and it was so it was so traumatizing for him that he never told anyone the story of that until he was you know well into his 30s or 40s when his best friend john forrester was writing his biography and so when you know when we keep a secret a dark secret like that you know yeah. how traumatizing it is but yeah. it also you know, instead of making him a Scrooge, it 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 made him a giant-hearted person, and he, you know, everything he wrote about was about you know children in poverty and women in poverty and people who struggle mm -hmm. and you know the ridiculousness of wealth and wealthy people and <laughs> um, and the injustices in in our in our systems and so you know as as you say, they're the same. You know, it's this. There's the same wealth inequality you know, the same kind of epidemic of poverty that that we live with today. We've just papered over it. It's not so in our faces. And um and it wasn't it was in Dickens' face all the time. And he and it wasn't when it wasn't, he went to see it. You know, he would famously walk through the streets of London every night, you know, for twenty miles, looking, you know, looking um certainly for inspiration, but also you, you know, those walks reinforced everything he believed about what was dark in, in, you know, in the world and what we had to fight with light. And so his writing is about the light, writing the light so that people can see. And I love the fact that over the course of his life, you know, literacy in England exploded. Hmm. And, um, as, you know, especially um, among the working classes. And, and to some extent, it's because for the first time, they had Dickens who was writing about them. And so they started reading Dickens when they were still illiterate. You know, they would gather when the monthly numbers would come out of his serialized novels. You know, they would gather in gin shops and someone who was literate would read to all the illiterates. 
and you know and that i mean if you know if if you're looking for something to make you want to read it's someone who's writing a book about you and, and about your life and so you know i you know i have to say i mean you know yes dickens is a hero of mine but you know he was also a deeply flawed man and um you know and at some point the 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 piece i wrote the essay i wrote in on lithub is you know very much about realizing that all my life I've been drawn to these sort of larger than life, charismatic, brilliant, powerful men who are deeply flawed, but, but like my father, but, you know, have had a heart as big as the world. You know, that's, I'm, I'm really drawn to that complexity in people because there's so much good that they can do. And there's so much, they can destroy. They have a lot, you know, in the patriarchy, those are the people with the most power. And, and ultimately the good has to win out. There's, we have no other option, <laughs> even yeah. though there's these dark, horrible sides to all of us. Yeah. They're, they're a good model for that. Yeah. And sorry to interrupt. I have a couple more questions to be mindful of your time, but uh, you were in London for some time, right? Or in, in England for a bit. Were you able to experience some of those areas that you that you wrote about that Dickens lived in that or or even for your second novel that made the work alive in some respect being present in those settings? Yes, and I've lived in London three three different times, um, okay. and um, very very in fact very close to Dickens' old stomping grounds. You know, the Dickens Museum mm -hmm. is um, oh, it's like mile from where I lived. And I lived in Islington, which is um, where Mary Wollstonecraft lived. And, she, you know, she had a school on Newington Green. I lived very, you know, was there. We'd go to the pub there every day. So, <laughs> and, you know, I also think there, there are parts of London, I always say that, you know, Victorian London is still very much there and present. And, you know, the co same cobblestones in a lot of the streets, um, mm -hmm. same, same buildings, same you know, views if you stand in certain places. And even though there's a certainly a veneer of incredible modernity, um, you know, in London, you don't have to squint very hard to see what it was. <laughs> and, you know, and there's certainly an effort as well to, to save what it was. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's really remarkable. But so I had that feeling very strongly. And even though I was writing Wollstonecraft during the pandemic and wasn't able to go back, I had in my head the feeling of those places. And um, it was, it's a great, I mean, to be able to travel when you're writing historical fiction, you know, go, go to the source and experience, you know, what that was like is invaluable. But, mm -hmm. um, but I had enough in my memory bank that I was able, able to draw on it. So London, and, you know, one of the greatest compliments people give me about um, certainly Dickens, Mr. Dickens, is that London feels like a character too. In the novel, I really love writing about the place, and you know, it's Mr. Dickens is my love letter to Charles Dickens in many ways, but it's also my love letter to London, um, in all its darkness and its light. Beautiful. Before we get into the playwriting aspect of it, because you're making a full circle to dramatic writing uh, with this story, but in in terms of the research, just to pass on some things that might be useful for. An individual who's starting on a on a journey of historical, you know, uh, research, or or maybe looking to to do a story about a historical figure. What are some things that that you would do better next time, mm -hmm. in terms of historical writing, or what insights, if you could maybe name a handful, would benefit somebody who's starting in this kind of work? One thing I would say is put up the piece of butcher block paper first thing before you open the first <laughs> book. Just have it there all the time, even if it's a document on your computer. Um, because because there's so much in the beginning when you start reading, you know, the biographies or the collected letters or the work or um, you have all these inputs. And I, you know, I read one biography called Romantic Outlaws, fantastic biography. Um, that's a dual biography of Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Shelley and its alternating chapters. And honestly, when I finished it, I thought, what's the point of writing a novel? This is so good. <laughs> it's a page turner. You know, uh, it's like a novel. Um, but going back to it, you know, again, and looking for those cracks in the story and the crumbs that, um, that, 
that Charlotte Gordon was leaving me and I could write those on post-it notes and start to put them up. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm, I'm a visual thinker and, you know, and an outliner and an arc drawer. I draw narrative and character arcs and, um, and I, you know, do a lot of that before I ever put pen to page, but I, but I do think, you know, starting to find a way to organize what will feel like chaotic thinking and just to record it and not necessarily you know, know where it's placed at that point. But if something, you read something, even if it's a tiny detail and it feels important to you, write it down, put it on the wall, you know, put it on the butcher block paper, put it in your document. And so, because what you begin to have is a, is a record of your own view of the story, your own way of picking, you know, picking the pieces of the story that are going to be important to you to tell. Mm -hmm. And um, if you don't start doing that right at the start, you know, you'll have to reconstruct it at some point. So, um, and I, you know, I also, I still, I still keep a, a writing journal, even when I'm working on um, a novel and I feel like, well, I ought to just go turn on my computer and start in the document right away. I really am a big believer in starting with kinetic hand writing in a journal so that even if, you know, if an idea comes to you in the night or you wake up from a dream or whatever, that you're so close to your unconscious mind at that point. And if you can, if you can get to a journal, it will continue to give, you know, you can continue to work out the idea because there's almost something about once you turn on the machine, the idea, you know, now you're just recording what you thought as opposed to, when you're handwriting, it's, it, you know, it's, it's evolving, you know, in sort of the curly cues of your, of your, <laughs> of your writing, it, it's the curly cues of your mind. And I think, you know, that, that that's a great habit, even writing historical fiction, that don't lose, you know, the gift of the stuff that happens in between, or if you're taking a walk, or if you're, you know, taking a shower, I mean, all those things, you know, those places where, where writers say, that's where my best, you know, my best ideas come from, pay attention to them, and don't feel like you immediately have to put them in a document, you know, because really, it's a conversation with yourself. And the more you're willing to engage in that conversation, you know, with yourself and your subconscious mind, the more you'll have to give when you when you when you sit down, you know, in the page you know, and, and write it on the page. Those are, those are, you know, a couple of important things. I'm a big dog ear. I write in books. I, I'm so embarrassed when I tell people this, but, you know, I have different colored pens. I annotate, yeah. I, you know, put, it's the put, tactile put, aspect of it that it really, yeah, it, gets it, things started. It's important to me and it's not important to everybody, but you know, when I look at my books now and there's all these, you know, flags, you know, <laughs> waving from the books, I'm like, yeah, that, you know, that book was really important to me. And so you, you keep returning to those. Those are the books you return to the most. And um, go back and back and back. And, you know, I have to say, too, that um, my father, the journalist, um, whom I lost last June, gave me a great piece of advice once. And he said that no matter how, how many notes you take or books you read or interviews you do or anything, at some point you have to put all that away and write what you know. And I think there's a tendency, um, certainly in historical fiction, to, to feel like if I could read one more article or one more book or know this one, you know, one more thing, then I can start writing. Then I can start writing this chapter or this section. And, I, you know, that's, that's a ruse, you know, that, that we enact on, our, on ourselves. And, and the truth is, you already know. At some point, you know you know. And you, what you have to do is close the books, close your notes, and just start writing. And so even though, you know, I'm a fastidious note taker and, you know, as I've, as and everything, but at some point I have to look away from that and trust myself and trust, you know, that I, that I really have a well, I have a reservoir now, you know, to, to write. And sometimes that'll only take you a chapter or a section or, but, um, but that's, you write better when you do that. When it's and it's more from you, it's more personal, and um, and th I would say those three things have been really important to me in 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 writing the two the two historical novels.
And those are so phenomenal bits of insight that I can't thank you enough. I was going to ask you more about the playwriting aspect of it, you know, since um, the the play, actually the novel is going to be adapted into a, a it play already, or you, it, it you worked on that already. Yes, it had its world premiere in November in Seattle at Seattle. Oh my goodness. Theater and ran for a month with 14 actors playing 40 roles. Oh, so in there, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> it was, it was, How was that? I wonder. It was, I would say, the greatest creative experience of my life. Just, you know, especially to, to have lived with that story for so long and to see it living and breathing there in front of you on stage, which is just such a gift. I can't, I can't imagine that. It's yeah. beautiful. And again, you know, I would say you referred to this that you know, after having written the novel and, you know, having had to take on all those jobs, it was, it was such a wonderful thing to give all those jobs back. Yeah. All the people, you know, to see the scenic designer and the costume designer and, you know, and the actors and the, you know, the props people and like all of them with imaginations greater than yours, you know, bringing the work to life. It's so much magic. And I really wanted it never to end. I pinched myself every day. <laughs> and, I, and the collaboration with um, Braden Abraham, the, the, um, the director, and, and the actors who are very much, you know, if that line's not working for them, they have to own it. <laughs> and so, you know, I was rewriting every day of a two-month rehearsal process. Every oh, time. goodness. And I loved it. And because, you know, you learn that you're agile as a writer and that you, you want it, you know, you don't want them to meet your needs as the writer. You want to meet their needs, which are the needs of the story. Mm -hmm. And so each iteration, screenplay, novel, play, has given me new gifts as a writer and taught me things that I now can take into what, you know, whatever it is <laughs> that I do next. And now I don't even predict it. I'm just like, I'm just going to go wherever. You You're know. open to what the cosmos is going to send <laughs> yeah. your way. Yes. But I think, yeah, this is a beautiful note to end on. And Samantha, there are so many things that I want to ask, but I will let you enjoy your Sunday. But I want to thank you for having this this drive to handle so much information, to craft something deeply personal out of it, and to remind us that there are heroes available for us to look up to and to learn from if we just look back a little bit and we try to you know, bring some of that past forward to remind us of what, what we need to do to do things better and for your time, because this has been amazing. And, uh, I really appreciate all of your wonderful insights. I loved it. Thank you so much for having me. So maybe next time, uh, I'll bug you about playwriting and screenwriting a little bit more. <laughs> I'll write another one first. Let me that's read. right. That's right. You let me know and, uh, and I'll be happy to connect, but I hope you have a wonderful Sunday and, uh, I'll be in touch on the internet. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye.